Okay, and now it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our artist this evening. Christina Hajar is a Lebanese artist, writer, and cultural worker based in Winnipeg, Manitoba on Treaty 1 territory. Her practice considers intergenerational inheritance, domesticity, and place through diaspora, body archives, and cultural iconography. As a queer femme and first generation subject, she is invested in the poetics of process, translation, and collaborative labor. Hajar is the co-founder of Carnation Zine and creator of Diaspora Daughter. Diaspora Dyke Zine, she was a recipient recipient of the 2020 Platform Photography Award and received an honorable mention for the 2021 Emerging Digital Artists Award. Her film Don't Forget the Water won the Jury Award and the Audience Choice Award for Best Manitoba Short Film at um, Gimli Film Festival. So I'll shortly pass it to Christina who will present um, on her the work of this exhibition and her art practice. Um, request that you um, just think about your questions, save them till the end. Feel free to put them in the chat and at the end we'll address them um, and have a group Q&A. All right, I will pass it to Christina. Thank you, Jara. Hi everyone for being here. Um, totally fine to keep your cameras off or you can put them on. Um, thanks for being here. Um, uh, speaking to you from Winnipeg, which is on Treaty 1 territory and the homeland of the Métis Nation. And I had the pleasure of um, doing a road trip to Regina for my first time ever uh, with my partner and going to install this exhibition, Don't Forget to Count Your Blessings. It was the second showing of this exhibition. The first one uh, was a year ago at Platform, uh, which is here in Winnipeg. And I'm, yeah, I'm excited to take you through each component of the exhibition and talk about my process and inspirations for this work. And my dog is also excited to talk to you. Okay. Okay, so you can see that, right? Jara, give me a thumbs up. Yeah, Jara is matching my slideshow right now. <laughs> this is the wallpaper for the exhibition. Um, so this is an installation-based exhibition uh, based on hookah lounges, and I'm not sure if everyone's had the chance to visit the show but um, the inspiration behind it is just hookah lounges in general and creating that feeling of being in a place that's centered around the idea of pleasure, leisure, connection, and food. And I, um, I chose to work with hookah lounges because of my connection to them um, as a first generation Lebanese Canadian and feeling like as an Arab that hookah lounges are a kind of cultural center um, where a lot of um, a lot of people from different cultures, uh, predominantly black and brown people go to enjoy themselves basically and hookah lounges have a long history. They're also um, they're also known as quite gendered spaces, um, but it is a little bit different in the diaspora, although still obviously existing within the system of uh, Western white supremacist patriarchy. And yeah, but I really enjoy going to hookah lounges because of this feeling that it gives me of like being connected to identity and, uh, being connected to home and and this idea of home as Lebanon for me, which is a place and a, and the Levant uh, and the Swana region are places that I've never been to. And so 
Um, partly that's why I turned to this work is to kind of contend with uh, my relationship with place and uh, use art as a sanctuary to be able to um, create connection through my practice. Um, and so uh, I mentioned the SWANA region that is uh, an acronym for Southwest Asia, North Africa, which is otherwise known as Middle East, North Africa. So um, that's a region that I connect with, uh, also the Levant region um, and uh, Lebanon, the country, and then more specifically um, Beirut and Beka Valley. So this exhibition um, was hugely motivated by the explosions in Beirut, which happened on August 4th, 2020. And it was at this time that I had been awarded the Platform Photography Award and basically um, a awarded a, a solo exhibition. And so um, contrary to the normal process of like having a very like thorough and diligent um, application for a gallery as to what you're going to do. It was kind of the other way around where I was uh, awarded exhibition space and didn't have a project yet. And so I really think that that kind of openness led to this project, which was basically me like sifting through um, months of grief contending with uh, diaspora and distance, uh, specifically in the aftermath of the Beirut blast. And so this is a poem that I wrote, Lebanon, and uh, I will read it because it's brief, but um, it was something that I wrote that week in response to the event. Lebanon, we will light the clouds on fire in memory of you. Ya Habibti, Ya Hilwe, your beauty swells over your tired edges naked skies. I don't want to be a resilient people searching the grounds of a cluttered heart. I woke, we dizzied, no homeland, a chain smoker like you. Inshallah, the rain will rinse the rubble and ash without bones shaking, shaking diaspora, like the language I wish to love you in. Chorus of hookahs, in vigil, we taste the salt the morning sea soft like my blooming tongue. Will I ever eat again without thinking of your hunger? The color red, yet burn it, but let the rose bush sing. Etch lost flesh, lost poems, dizzy with myrrh. Though the door is open, you have always looked best in gold. So <clears throat> this, this poem um, was kind of the first step into um, just dealing with the grief that I was wading through at the time of um, having like basically witnessing catastrophe from afar and having that experience of like being in diaspora on Instagram and like constantly um, bombarding myself with news and feeling like um, that hopelessness of you of not being able to help like in a physical way uh, where like people uh, where the, the public was literally coming together to clean the streets of glass and rubble after this happened and um, in the diaspora it's like this like hopeless feeling or a restless feeling of not knowing what to do. And yeah, that was kind of the first step. And I think before I continue, um, I'm going to show you the exhibition video tour. And uh, this is where I start to get into more of the process uh, around creating the show. So I'm gonna exit out of this.
Okay, so I hope that gave you a little taste of the exhibition. Um, so I first wanted to talk about this tablecloth and um, basically what you're looking at is um, Google, the Google Translate app, which has an instant camera feature pointed at the tablecloth and attempting to translate this Arabic phrase here. And so uh, this tablecloth was like the true catalyst of this exhibition, though there were so many. And um, basically, uh, I was mentioning like my feelings of grief after the Beirut blast. And uh, that week I had gone to a hookah patio um, to just be with friends and smoke shisha and like feel held in space. And um, they had a hookah light um, shining through their window. And so that was like a kind of um, profound moment for me to uh, decide to create my project around the concepts of hookah lounges. And so um, not too long ago, a new Middle Eastern grocery store had opened in Winnipeg and my partner and I went and it was opening weekend and it was really exciting because um, I feel like whenever I get to go to a new Arab store um, or like Middle Eastern grocery store or whatever it is, um, I learn more just by virtue of like shopping and like seeing these objects and then like having those objects be a catalyst um, to have conversations with my mom and then do further research uh, for my practice. So I basically um, was excited to, to find this tablecloth uh, there, which is like a plastic roll. And it's like a disposable roll that you just, I mean, use however many times you want, but um, it was it was rolled up. And so I couldn't see what the text was. And although I can understand some Arabic, I can't uh, really speak or read it. Like I'm learning to read it, but anyways, it was in a roll. So it was just like a fragment of text. Um, but I saw the roses, uh, which are really significant to me. And so I purchased it anyways. And then after I was really excited to open it and I took a photo of um, the tablecloth and I sent it to my mom asking for a translation. And her reply was, it depends on the context. It says, don't forget to count your blessings. And it reads, latensi atasmian. And so I did more research about this phrase and um, I learned that it has a pretty heavy like religious connotation because what the message is telling you is basically to pray before you eat. And so I was trying to think about like um, just this concept of praying and like um, how I show gratitude um, and how I can use this phrase to think through my subject position as a diasporic person. And, and not for like the privilege of being in diaspora, although I can't deny that either, um, but for the privilege of practicing art and for the privilege of enjoying food and um, just thinking about pleasure uh, through this um, through this motto, through this phrase. And so I went to a friend's house after, I was still um, kind of wrestling with this translation and they showed me the Google Translate app and, and I was really, really excited that um, it was providing mistranslations and that it was like glitching in this really interesting way. And so I took a screenshot video with my phone uh, of the Google Translate app basically glitching over the text and my hand like smoothing out the, uh, the, the paper, the plastic. <laughs> I wanna say like the paper towel, no, the plastic tablecloth <laughs> um, to try and get the translation. But I was more excited about the mistranslations that were coming 
Um, and they were like, don't forget to breathe. Don't forget about nurturing. Uh, don't forget the water. Don't forget about development. And um, yeah, I, I felt like they were a really good next step for my practice. I mean, I was already excited about that video in itself and felt like that could be like its own project. And so at the time, oh, sorry, I have to backtrack. Um, uh, no, maybe I'll, yeah, okay. So in the wallpaper that you see here, there's um, these Lebanese coffee cups. They're iconic to Lebanon. Um, but my friend uh, recently informed me that they're also iconic to Ethiopia. And so uh, I was really interested in thinking about um, these cultural objects as uh, like laden with uh, transcultural affiliations. And that's something that I was uh, kind of thinking a lot about while I was reading this book, Unruly Visions, The Aesthetic Practices of Queer Diaspora by Gayathri Gopinath. And it was uh, my mentor at the time, Nazarene Hamada, who had recommended this text for me. And I felt really excited about um, thinking, uh, thinking about place in a different way that was being presented in this book and thinking about nostalgia and my subject position in the diaspora. Um, and Guy through Gopinath also talks about how art process is important for queer diasporic subjects to resist oppressive ideologies and come into being. So basically how um, art is a process of becoming and also how affiliation and connection with others comes from a consideration of difference within a common frame. So by that, basically just like considering um, cross-cultural experiences of diaspora and what are the similarities among us um, looking through a common frame in order to understand systems not in order to flatten experiences and, and create like monoliths out of groupings of people um, but to think through the idea of affiliation and so that was another thing that energized me about the site of the hookah lounge is that it's inherently a transcultural space and it's a very significant space because it's also um, it's also about transients. Um, so although a lot of people reflect to me that the exhibition feels like a home space, um, it is also very much um, like a temporary public experience. And yeah, and hookah lounges are also um, places of coming of age as well, and spaces of bonding. So through my practice, uh, I was thinking about place and placemaking, and um, through this like grief and feeling of distance, I was craving, um, craving a place that I could feel connected to. Um, but then I started to trouble this idea of belonging and placemaking um, because I didn't want to just like replicate. Um, the idea was not to just like create a hookah lounge as if um, I was like a business person and like what would my hookah lounge look like if I started a business, which would be a very cool other project. But um, you notice that there's no actual hookahs in this hookah lounge uh, because the idea is more about symbolism and just like that experience of um, that original experience that I had of like being under the hookah light and just feeling immersed in that possibility. Um, yeah, and so uh, other aspects of thinking through placemaking was also queering space and um, considering like my experience of going to hookah lounges and how they're very, very heteronormative. And um, as a queer person, like it's always my desire to like be in more queer spaces. And so naturally in this exhibition that I'm creating, which is supposed to be like an installation where people can relax in, I wanted to think about how I could also queer this space as well. 
So the first step I was thinking through was um, the different things that exist in hookah lounges. And so you notice that uh, that's also why I decided to create wallpapers, that they're always very immersive. Um, these like Middle Eastern aesthetics are always uh, very focused on patterns. And so I created my own pattern with the wallpaper. But then when it came to the photographs, I was thinking, um, like, what is the imagery that we encounter in restaurants and hookah lounges? And I, I was thinking a lot about uh, experiences that I've had in, in establishments that I, that just like exist in my mind that I've visited through my life, where um, you'll go to like uh, an Arab restaurant, for example, and they ha often have a lot of landscape imagery of homeland. And so I was thinking about the kind of like romanticization or like simplification or even self and self orientalizing um, that happens just when um, these images get put up in the workplace like how is the homeland being represented and like for whose gaze or like for what mental shortcut is this like like um like a picture of Aladdin or you know like even even not something so explicitly as Aladdin but I'm also speaking about just like beautiful landscape imagery something that you would see like on a postcard and so uh myself like being someone who's never been to Lebanon I was thinking about how I might be able to uh visually represent a place that I've never been to. And so this is why I chose to photograph my sister against a backdrop of blue sky. And I just pointed my lens upward uh, toward the absence of landscape and um, just completely ignore the landscape. <laughs> um, so we went to the beach, it was September and it was very, very windy. And I kind of just gave the prompt to my sister to explore the materiality uh, of this plastic tablecloth and throw it in the wind and catch wind and just improvise. And so I think she felt very uncomfortable with it at first. Um, this kind of uh, prompt was very loose and playful and it was a chaotic environment with the wind and so I think she, at first she was struggling with uh, knowing knowing if she was like doing it right or she didn't she she wanted to make sure that I was happy basically as like her sister and the the person facilitating this um, but we ended up spending a lot of time there and I feel really excited about um, the photos that emerged from this process. So the blue in the wallpaper is extracted from the blue in the sky. And then the blue uh, background of the poem prints are the same as the uh, photos of my sister. So it's supposed to create a feeling of like a continuum of sky. And it's supposed to feel like immersive slash transcendent, which I know is a contradictory. <laughs> Those are contradictory terms, but I think I'm still like tugging and pulling between um, knowing what I want people to feel when they're there, which is kind of like a reflection of my idea of placemaking, which is um, which is uh, this concept of being immersed, which is like being very rooted, being very present, being here. And then transcendence, which is like being elsewhere, this kind of dreaminess, otherworldliness. And I feel like that kind of happens through so much like sky imagery. And so I think there is like this tug and pull of like, stay, go, stay, go. 
And um, this really was created for the purpose of like people hanging out in the space. And so when I previously exhibited this project last year, um, there there wasn't uh, there weren't any gatherings because of COVID. And so this was the first time that I was able to really feel that the exhibition was activated, um, which was really important to me. But I'll speak more about that later. Um, to return to the photographs of my sister, uh, I was thinking through, again, Gopinath's ideas of placemaking, but also her uh, concept of states of suspension. And so she talks about how queer diasporic aesthetics disorient us and reorient us. They unsettle normative temporalities by pointing to alternative pathways and routes through the past and to the future that bypass the familiar touchstones of hetero and homonormative life histories. In so doing, they emplace us in a state of productive suspension. So um, that's kind of what I was going for with the photographs as well as like this feeling of suspension and um, that like the sense of time and place has been warped. And so the next uh, main uh, fixture of a hookah lounge that I wanted to think through are how there are always music videos playing uh, at hookah lounges. And like when you think of a lounge in general, there are always like a lot of TVs. And so, I mean, in the future, it'd be cool to just like have it even more like bombarded with TVs, like like in a sports lounge kind of way. But um, yeah, thinking about music videos as a prompt for myself to create videos for this exhibition. I was thinking through the concept of luxury and this, the question of luxury. And so I returned to the tablecloth screenshot video that I had captured and uh, created a video called uh, Don't Forget the Water. And I, it's basically um, the video, the screenshot video that I took is projected onto a table with the tablecloth on it. So you're looking at two layers of the tablecloth and, and the, the top layer is the digital, um, the digital mistranslations that are being activated through Google Translate. Uh, there's also a sound piece to this and uh, people can listen to it through a phone. It's a phone conversation between my mom and I. Uh, so I won't play the whole thing, but I'll just jump in the middle, I guess. Hey. Uh huh. So in the video, she, I I'm asking her how to make Arabic coffee, ahwe and I've never, I had never made it for myself at home. And I was really excited because I had purchased these things from that new uh, grocery store and my partner had bought the cups for us. And um, I do a lot of this food process research with my mom where I record her recipes while I'm in the kitchen with her. And, and then that recipe is a catalyst for further research into certain ingredients. Um, but this is our conversation around coffee. Uh, oh, I don't know. You put, you can put, because this country, they don't like it better. Like put one teaspoon of sugar. Okay. Well, how do you normally make it? Yeah, I like that. Okay. Yeah. And you boil it, and you stay with it so it doesn't make a huge mess. And you boil it till the top is clear. Uh, what do you mean the top is clear? You will see. Initially, the coffee ground floats on top, and as it boils, it settles at the bottom. Okay, and so do you have to lift it from the heat when it's boiling? I lift it so it doesn't make a mess. So you have to stay with it and kind of stir it. Do you actually stir it with a spoon or do you mean just lifting it? No, I stir it with a spoon. Okay. 
And what, like, should it be on, like, medium heat, high heat? Okay, so this is just a five-minute video of uh, my mom telling me how to make ahoy arabe. And then um, in the video, my body is partly visible, um, pouring the coffee at the beginning and then taking it out of the frame to drink it. And then I'm, I swirl the cup and return it upside down in order to dry out for a fortune, um, which is the practice of tassiography. And then uh, the video ends as the cup is drying out. So we don't, there's no like fortune revealed or there's no uh, coffee ground uh, imagery revealed. Um, so with this video, I was thinking more deeply about the, the phrases, uh, the mistranslations and feeling sentimental towards the mistranslations, uh, that the failure of the technology could be a prompt. Um, and failure is something that I am really energized by in my practice in general. Um, it's something that I kind of um, grappled with at the beginning of my practice and still am and thinking about how so much of my practice has to do with my mom and connecting with my mom and her stories of uh, living in Lebanon and her stories of uh, Lebanese civil war and immigration to Canada. And so um, when I think so this failure was really like kind of revealed itself through my practice as I was trying to um, in experience these visceral memories that she recounted for me uh, related to food and not being able to have like the embodied memory to really understand fully like the extent of what she was trying to explain to me. And then also in a practical sense, when she's like explaining recipes to me, there's that disconnect of um, having that embodied knowledge, which comes so naturally to her and then kind of taking that for granted um, in fully being able to communicate like how to make something because it, it just seems so obvious. But me, I'm like three teaspoons, like, you know, I'm like clarifying every little thing and she just thinks it's like kind of annoying, but endearing in an endearing way. Like there's no real tension at play, but there is um, there is that subtlety there that you can pick up on. So yeah, thinking about failure as a queer diasporic methodology. Um, in embracing uh, glitch and mistranslation through this work. And, uh, and then in the next video, which was created for um, this iteration of the exhibition, uh, the, the previous iteration of this exhibition just had the one video, Don't Forget the Water. Um, so this is a new work called Wurud Baladi, uh, which is Flowers of My Country. And it's a video uh, of uh, my friend uh, Dasha Savchenko tattooing uh, the roses, the cluster of roses that are on the tablecloth. And I'll play a little bit of the video, although it is silent.
Okay, I think that's about good. So uh, the aesthetics of this uh, video were definitely me leaning into more of those conventional uh, standards of luxury. Um, definitely when I think of uh, music videos, I think of lavish culture, big houses, um, like beautiful women, uh, nice clothes, just like wealth basically um, is like the basis of like these um, of, of a lot of music videos. And so, um, yeah, I decided to kind of like lean into those aesthetics in a bit, but still subvert it in a way. Um, I rented an Airbnb uh, to create this set in, um, which was um, the process of which is where we created the set for this tattoo process. And uh, the rose tattoo was motivated by um, a promise that my mom and sister and I had made to each other to each get rose tattoos for each other. And so my, my sister has already done it, but um, I was the second one to do mine. So my mom still hasn't done hers yet, but um, it felt really perfect that uh, this project that includes my family so heavily already includes like a rose motif and so I decided to just tattoo that rose cluster onto my leg and uh in a way I feel like um that the mistrans I, I feel that like the meaning around the tablecloth as a whole is like now like inscribed uh just like by virtue of having the symbolism of those flowers there inscribed on the body um and then uh other parallels i was thinking through between the two videos was um just excess and mess and like the visual uh I don't know if you want to say synonymity, but like just like the visual parallels between coffee grounds and uh, tattoo ink and thinking about um, this excess that is created um, with the with the tattoo video, I was really keen on capturing a mess throughout the process. So these are some of the stills. And so other connections um, for me uh, with roses are um, just like other research that I've done, um, which kind of started with my mom teaching me how to make baklava. And it's a Lebanese dessert uh, that uses rose water. And so uh, that's partly why the rose water is in the wallpaper is um, the sweets that you might be served at a hookah lounge. And my mom's name, Nada, um, also means morning dew on a rose in Arabic. And so there are a lot of just like inherent connections there for me with roses. And then of course, like who could forget that they're like a symbol of like romance and love and femininity. And so I wanted to lean into that, even though like it's not lost on me that um, like the strain of what I think of roses in my imaginary of like um, long stem cut roses uh, is absolutely <laughs> completely different than um, the roses uh, of my mother's nostalgia and now like my inherited nostalgia of uh, Lebanese landscape and of her childhood home that she um, explained to me uh, her rituals of uh, making rose tea with the rose bush in front of her home and like picking the rose buds and preparing that for herself every day. And, and I think a lot of these um, things like also relate to my, con my thinking through failure and like these like idea of false equivalence. And so uh, that comes through with the roses and then there is also, um, 
I don't know if you saw like the date, uh, the, the palm trees, uh, the palm house plants, um, but that was a deliberate decision as well to include those because of a, a documentary that I had watched um, by Jocelyn Saab, who's a late Lebanese filmmaker, and she was covering the Lebanese Civil War. And uh, this was in the 70s. And there was a lot of footage of burnt down uh, date palms. And uh, that being just like a, a side effect, just like a, a consequence of the war. And that, that visual really stayed with me. And so I wanted to kind of, uh, you know, like nod to, give a nod to like that landscape in a way by, um, signaling to it through a, like a false equivalent. So this was just uh, a part of the installation as well. I included a cup uh, that I drank from. Uh, I, I prepared the coffee at the at the art gallery. And um, I brought a little portable um, coil outlet and I made the coffee at the gallery. And um, we, we drank it together, those who were installing that day. And I left my cup to dry out on a shelf. And so my cup for like my fortune reading is, um, now like going to be there for me once the exhibition comes down and I'll have someone interpret the cup for me. Uh, what you're looking at on the right hand side is a different red shelf where I filled a cup uh, of coffee and I left it for the duration of the exhibition. And this was uh, created as an altar to my late father um, because of the visual presence of well, not visual, the, well, the visual presence of my sister and then the uh, presence of my mom uh, and her voice in my video work, I wanted to include um, my dad as well. And I was kind of um, experimenting with this process of what would it be like to read someone's coffee grounds who cannot drink from their cup, who is, um, who's not with us uh, on this plane and um, and how can I how can I use this experiment as like uh, another like form of connection and communication so I had done this once before on my dad's death anniversary where I uh, poured a cup of coffee for him on his altar and it had dried out uh, if you can see through my webcam it had dried out like this and I was intrigued that um there were more like classic like there were more like waves and squiggles which is really what you get when you um drink from a cup and put it upside down to dry it out um and then there's like a thick uh bottom layer of coffee there um and now it's so dry that it's like cracking but when Jara sent me this photo from the exhibition just a couple of days ago, I was kind of stunned because at the bottom of the cup, it looks like there's a thumb imprint, which is a step that some people do um, when they're getting their coffee grounds read, is that sometimes the reader will ask you to put your thumb imprint at the bottom of the cup and that should reveal like something else. Um, and so I was just kind of expecting to see black at the bottom and to see this like, um, this clearing felt so like stark and deliberate. And so I'm not a coffee reader, but at the same time, it's one of those things that is just like an intuitive imaginative process, not to take away from like how legit uh, it is and how um, much experience comes with the people who do it. But I feel like, um, I feel excited to kind of, uh, let myself be imaginative through this process of like, what could my dad be saying to me through this cup, but also, um, I am going to be interested in possibly like reaching out to someone who does coffee readings to like, maybe ask if they, I can have their interpretation of it. 
Um, yeah. And so I mentioned that uh, I made the coffee in the space. And so that was served to um, the gallery staff and installers. And I felt like that intimate kind of setting was the way in which I wanted to be uh, a server. Um, I, I've done like other art projects where I'm creating something for the public that they are consuming. And so when I was thinking through placemaking and what, what the role of hospitality was for me in this context, I really wanted to create a space where I could also enjoy and like sit back and relax and, and play backgammon with guests and really uh, spend my time focusing on having conversations about the work and having conversations about backgammon and playing backgammon. So the food, uh, which is served on the tablecloth as well, um, I had done research to find um, an Arab owned um, uh, restaurant where we could order from. And so uh, that's what happened. Um, and we had Manaish and uh, Karakti and Kataif, uh, a tie of dessert. And these were, I was really excited to get these backgammon boards um, shipped directly from Beirut. Uh, these handmade backgammon boards with cute tiny dice. And there was um, there was an instruction sheet of how to play uh, backgammon or shesh besh. And on the flip side of it, um, there were three QR codes with playlists. And so I had commissioned three people to make playlists for the exhibition, which were uh, the which, which were playing in the exhibition throughout the whole run and um, the three playlists were kind of split um, throughout the whole exhibition run. And I wanted to present them uh, in this way so that it is uh, something that people can take away as well. It's like a Spotify playlist that you can keep and add to your library. Uh, so I'll link to that in the chat as well so that you can keep them or check them out too. And that is all I wanted to just um, say my thank yous. Um, there are, we have image, uh, image credits and funding support. Thank you to Canada Council for the Arts, Manitoba Arts Council and Winnipeg Film Group. And uh, thank you to this whole list of people who um, completely um, lended their creative labor, physical labor, uh, emotional support and all kinds of um, involvement in this project to create what it was. So thank you. That was awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, it is entirely possible that a visitor put their thumb in that coffee. <laughs> 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 I know, like, um, like I had those, um, I had those Arabic sweethearts um, in a different project, um, and um, is so funny because the curator of that gallery was emailing me and telling me that like gallery visitors kept eating the sweethearts, which um, were a part of the exhibition yes, or which were a part of the installation. Happened. Yes. <laughs> Today or the day before someone um I don't know I can't confirm if they ate it but it went away but <laughs> it's okay pretty long but then now I just like <laughs> luckily the iconography of it is like in the wallpaper so I can be like and there was a, there was a sweetheart here <laughs> yeah the sweetheart made it um until the video tour was shot so that makes me happy <laughs> at least it was there um, and it's funny because like a lot of visitors need to be instructed like you can sit please sit please mm -hmm. like you know please make yourself comfortable 
hookah lounge, etc. But then there's also a component of like there's these little household objects that are just kind of like so tantalizing to people. Like people are just like drawn to those objects and and drawn to the iconography too. Like like almost like these games of I spy of like uh, mm-hmm. one of the a popular question was because you know the cups um or make an appearance in the exhibition the rose water you know is is there um the candy is there like most common question is like people trying to find the locket or the oh yeah (laughs) that's so interesting to hear so that is a grape uh that's a grape pendant that I got from my late godmother and it's not anywhere else in the exhibition but yeah, that's such a good point that there is so much repetition of imagery throughout the exhibition, but that one is just singular. Mm-hmm. Um, although um, um, somebody did point out it makes an appearance in your text, in the, the zine mm-hmm. that you have. So, yes. Yeah. yeah, I should link to that too. Let me yeah. get these links for you all. Um, hmm. somebody graffitied in it also speaking of like strange engagement <laughs> that's cool yeah <laughs> it's been a really hard spring I think and like because it was getting nice this exhibition was installed then we had like one at least one blizzard after that and like um you know we were talking a bit before we opened the the zoom to everyone just like gallery a sanctuary and you use that word in your presentation as well it's like it is that space that like hearth that you can you know find calm um and i think that in my experience this spring this exhibition has been that for a lot of people um and even though there's these like the weighty criticality of like what you're you're studying um, as you're thinking through these ideas and um, the you know the source text you're looking at, there is also these like the simplicity of some of the motifs and stuff that um, people can. There's yeah, there are some people that came back again and again um, who necessarily didn't necessarily maybe weren't familiar with like an art gallery as a space, but found some sort of refuge. Um, yeah, it totally goes with how you were, you were coming to a lot of the themes. Yeah, um, thank you. That's yeah. cool to hear. Um, these, a quick aside, uh, these are available for sale, these zines um, at the gallery. And um, starting tomorrow, there will also be a exhibition response text available um, that folks can pick up at the gallery or read online um, that was written by, uh, co-written by Shima and Shemim Agaminha. So there's some some discourse to, to be had uh, when you come in. And um, yeah, Christina has dropped some, some links in the text there. Um, but yeah, I kind of started things off uh, stream of consciousness, but does anyone in the group have questions um, to ask Christina or to discuss? Hi, Christine. Thanks for, Christina, thanks for sharing uh, and touring us through the show. I was wondering if you could talk more about the, like kind of the process of collaborating with family or like how you, consider their contributions and like at what point, like I know when work like I've worked with a few, know a few people that have worked with others and when people aren't artists, there can be some trepidation or like there's different levels of collaboration. I'm wondering how far, like does your mom have input in the sound or does she get last review of before things are like included in exhibition and, and, and whatnot? Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it's a constant, um, negotiating with myself and figuring out how I want to um, involve them um, and then then it becomes like a negotiation with them but um, firstly it's a negotiation with myself of like 
how do I want to present my family and what is the purpose of that? And like, how is their um, narrative going to be interpreted? Um, and just like that balance of like vulnerability versus um, like privacy and like exposing my family, my family's privacy, even though my work is so, so much about uh, creating archives. And so um, when I started to take myself more seriously as an artist, I just kind of started that path through food and wanting to uh, collect my mom's recipes. And I thought like, I don't really know if being an artist is like what I'm going for, but I know that collecting these recipes is like the most important thing that I could do. And so I'm, I don't necessarily know what this is for or why I'm doing it, but not why I'm doing it. I knew why I was doing it. Um, it was to create an archive, but um, I didn't know what it would become, but I knew that that was like the main purpose. So that was kind of like, step one is like, just like to figure out like, um, what like the purpose was, but when it came to these projects, um, I actually usually don't uh, work with my sister in my projects. So this was like the first time inviting her in and that felt really exciting because um, it was just such an open prompt to like give to her and just um, just play, have that experience of play like one-on-one -on -one and just see what came of it. Um, I think there's just like those classic family tensions of like, um, my sister tripping up and feeling like she wanted to do a good job for me, but me kind of like telling my mom and sister that the point isn't to like look pretty or something, you know, like in my art. Um, and, and then yeah with my mom and that phone conversation like it it was just um yeah it was pretty straightforward like I I just um had asked her in advance and then recorded the phone conversation and then um everything goes through like levels of consent and like making sure that they're good with how they're being represented. I feel really blessed and lucky that my mom is like um, pretty open about wanting to be in my work. And yeah, there is not really much collaboration when it comes to like the final um, look of things. It's just kind of like involving them uh, in the steps that they're involved in and then like showing them after it and asking them like if they like it and and also like the framing as well like when I write about my work I make sure that they're okay with like how I'm writing about them um because I don't want them to feel like any kind of way about it so yeah yeah that's what I'll say Does anyone else have a question they're pondering? And feel free to drop questions in the chat too, um, which I can then relay. <laughs> well, um, I know some of you have seen the exhibition, but just in case you haven't, it's up until May 21st. Um, but there's a, you know, there will exist a beautiful archive that thank you so much for, uh, you know, having that documentation video made, Christina, like, what how how wonderful <laughs> um and you know things like the podcast and things and i love that this has been an expansion of a project that you started 
and that the story just keeps, you know, unraveling, dare say, like the the plastic tablecloth. <laughs> yeah. So I'm excited. Yeah, I want to keep building on the project for sure and present it. Um, I'd be curious to present it um, in a city that has a big Arab population like Toronto or Montreal. Um, it's definitely a goal of mine to bring it there and just see how that kind of audience engagement would happen in the space. Um, because like part of the reason I create this work is because like of a lack of community feeling uh, that I have here in the prairies. And so, um, yeah, I just wonder what it would be like, what it would be like there, or even what it would be like in Lebanon. Like, would that even make sense? But one day I will go there and do art stuff. <laughs> well um that about does it for me thank you so much for saying this to you um, yeah thanks to everyone for coming and i hope you have a lovely lovely evening thank you for being here <laughs> bye